Hello everyone, this is Eva Nolik smith with Yoga You Online and I'm very pleased to be here today with yoga therapist and author Ellen Salzenstahl. Most of you know Ellen for the pioneering work she has done together with Dr. Lauren Fishman on yoga for osteoporosis and you're probably also familiar with the book Ellen co-wrote with uh, Dr. Fishman on yoga for osteoporosis. But, but Ellen is a very versatile yoga teacher with more than 40 years of training behind hers. She just released a new book called Anatomy and Yoga, a guide for teacher and students. And she teaches nationally and internationally on topics related to anatomy and yoga therapeutics. And most importantly, for the purpose of our conversation today, Ellen is also a pioneer in integrating techniques from our fascial release into a self-care program and into our yoga practice. And she teaches a method for our fascial release called the called body mind ball work, which it, which is a unique method of self massage using. Um, balls to release very deep-seated tension in the body. So Ellen, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. So um, tell us about your background um, and your interest in myofascial release. How did you get involved with body-mind uh, ball work? Um, I started my training as, uh, you know, in my 20s as a dancer. And most dancers um, get injured at some point rather soon in their careers and seek out different therapeutic modalities. So being in New York City, I was doing that. I was seeking out different uh, healing techniques. And I certainly went for massage and became a massage therapist because I saw how wonderful that was. And I also met Elaine Summers, who was teaching a method called kinetic awareness using rubber balls. So I began practicing that as a self-care technique, both curative of injuries and preventative of new injuries, and uh, worked with her for many, many years and uh, kept developing the work, training teachers, uh, experimenting with it myself, and then eventually decided to change the name of my method, which I have developed from Kinetic Awareness. The name that I use is Body Mind Ball Work. So that's my background, and it's a continuous practice for me for over 40 years. Mm, interesting. And what led you to use the term uh, body mind ball work as opposed to kinetic awareness? Well, Elaine's focus was dance. She was a choreographer and a filmmaker, mm -hmm. and her big mission was to educate dancers in being more um, expressive in their bodies by understanding their own movement more intimately and more thoroughly, and allowing their, their natural expressive movement to come out. That was her focus. And I was a dancer at the time, so it was perfect for me. But as I began to teach over my career, I was teaching more people who were not dancers than I was teaching dancers. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, I just wanted to think about how the method not only makes you more expressive that way in a, in, a, in a kind of artistic way, but also just more able to be embodied fully as a person, more integrated in emotional realm, mental realm, and in every way. So embodiment as a full practice. So that's why I saw it for a new name and for, for the method and came up with body mind ball work because it's very direct. It tells you that balls are involved yeah. and it tells you that the mind and the body are, are a unit. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. And my facial uh, release has kind of become a buzzword. We hear the term a lot. Yes. Um, and I wonder how you would describe it. I mean, the two parts of the muscles, myo refers to muscles, and the second re, uh, part refers to the fascial web of the body. Is, is that correct? Yes. Well, um, as a dancer, I was experiencing the fascial web without having any words to describe it. And then at a certain point, started reading about the fascial research that was going on and began to study with some of the teachers that are prominent in the field. And, um, you know, became very excited because I could already experience it. And here were people researching it and writing about it and it establishing a real um, body of knowledge. So that was exciting for me. Um, so the, the, the fascial web being a body pervasive web of connective tissue that has really rich sensory 
nerve supply is always giving us information, always coordinating our movements, transferring force through the body, all through the body, even from head to toes. And it has to be involved with any body therapy. It just has to. There's no other way to see how all the parts of the body relate to each other mm -hmm. without that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. So um, when we think about tension in the body, um, you know, we're all familiar with muscular tension, tight shoulders. Um, we all have parts of the body where the muscles are tight. Um, but we're usually, even though we're familiar with the idea of releasing muscular tension, um, so the term, you know, myofascial release would imply that the fascial web holds tension as well? Yes, it does hold tension because it responds to the stress level in our body, the chemical level of stress in the body. So the cells within the fascia can contract, not because we tell them to, the way we would tell our biceps to contract when we lift up a cup of coffee, but they do contract and then they, they also can release. So the, 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 the myofascia has, has that contractibility and also elasticity. So that's the, the fascinating thing is that we can change the texture and, and the uh, pliability and the elasticity of our fascia with these techniques. Mm, interesting. And so how, what is the principle for how that works? Well, there's several different things which I go into in the webinar. There's the pressure of the ball creating a nervous system response with the Ruffini endings, part of our mechanoreceptor system. And then there's, um, there's other ways that the nervous system calms down with one or two stimuli, or maybe even more, which could be the breathing and it could be the stretching of the muscles. So there's different mechanisms at work that cause an overall relaxation, which um, is really pleasant and useful when you're stressed. But also, there's the, the particular stretching and um, release of the particular part of the body that you used to work on, like tension in the shoulders, tension in the neck. Mm -hmm. So when you use a tool like Body Mind Ball Work uses rubber balls, you can direct that effect to a particular part of your body really specifically, mm -hmm. but also get this overall relaxation because of the way the nervous system responds to that pressure. It's wonderful. Yeah, it's it's very interesting. I um, I sometimes at night rely on you know two balls, two tennis balls, and slowly run them up the spine, and I get to like lower part of the thoracic spine, and I'm sound asleep. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what causes that? <laughs> well, as I said, the pressure from the balls is is talking to the receptors inside our fascia. And those receptors, certain ones, um, just create this overall parasympathetic response, which is, you know, sleep can be part of that. It doesn't have to be. You don't have to fall asleep. But I do that, too. I do, I do the ball work in bed, and it does help with sleep. Yeah. It really yeah. does. Very interesting. Yeah. Um, so, of course, my facial release techniques are increasingly popular as a way to help relieve stress and chronic pain. So, which are the people this can particularly be useful for? Well, yogis and dancers and athletes, for sure, you know, get frequent injuries because we challenge ourselves. We challenge ourselves to do crazy poses. Uh, we challenge ourselves into athletic pursuits or, or extreme, you know, exertion in a dance performance. and yeah, the body has its limits, so sometimes something happens where you get a strain. But also, everyday people, either because of their posture or their habits of holding tension in the body from emotional causes, that, those are just two common examples, um, can get nagging pains that can be really helped by myofascial release. Interesting. And is this something you do like regular over a period of time? to get the effect or you can you do it once well and... you can do it once and maybe it'll give you that um, immediate relief and maybe it'll last depends on how long you've carried that tension and how many times you recreate the activity that caused it right. but let's say you had a momentary lapse in your you know use of your body like you lifted up a really heavy box the wrong way or something like that right. you might get permanent relief from just one session on the balls 
But I always recommend that you, you know, do it on a regular basis as prevention and as increasing your body awareness overall, increasing your, your sense of yourself as a body-mind whole. Right. Because it's what it does. It keeps, it keeps coming back to the fact that our experiences are always lodging in the body. And that's, that's a great thing, but it can be problematic. So if we have stuck places in the body, we might be able to um, relieve them from a mo an emotional standpoint as well as a physical standpoint. Mm. So um, I, do, I do recommend regular practice, but of course, you know, people do what they can do. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah. And early on, you related, um, and you described the body-mind ball work technique. You also described it as a technique for embodiment. Could you elaborate on what you meant by that? Well, it's it's a term that I'm interested in because it it does uh, underscore the fact that um, we we can be fully in the body or we can be kind of carrying out our daily activities without any regard for the body mm -hmm. and just um, focusing on what has to get done, the intellectual tasks, the manual tasks that we have to do, but but not recognizing you know, the ongoing process that's always there mm -hmm. telling us how the body is. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, some might say, well, that I don't have time for that. You know, I don't want to know what's going on. <laughs> so, you know, I don't think it, the, the whole uh, prospect or project of being embodied is for everybody. Yeah. But I would hope that people involved with yoga get a taste of the pleasure and, um, you know, deep, uh, enlargement of your consciousness that comes from being aware of your body. So it's, it's just being fully alive, really, is what it is. Yeah. And in yoga, we talk about the levels of awareness we have in the body. We have the physical body. We have the, ment the breath body. We have the mental body. We have the wisdom body, and we have the bliss body. So that was a very fast rendition of, of the koshas, which I'll talk about more in the webinars. But <clears throat> these levels of being are all being expressed on a moment-to-moment -moment basis in our physical body. So to me, embodiment is taking time, not like all day, every, you know, every moment, but taking time frequently during the day to remember that and to experience it. Yeah, yeah. And for those of us who, who have studied this, and many people in the psychology world have studied it too, it, it's, it's grounding and it's health promoting and um, just really worth it, really worth it. Uh, making that effort to get into the habit of sensing your own body. Mm, yeah. So it gives you essentially another tool in your toolbox for us for various self-care techniques. You can Yes, and for health, for health too, because I do believe that when you're more aware of your body, you can catch the small problems before they get to be big problems. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, as we know, prevention and early care, you know, in so many disease processes really important right right yeah and of course um there's been a lot of discussion in the yoga community about injuries yoga yes. injuries so is this a way people can help prevent injuries or work with areas that might have gotten a little overstretched absolutely so um it it's good in terms of balancing out the different parts of the body. So let's say you're in a yoga practice where you've been working on a certain type of pose. Let's say a twist, just to take an example. There are certain parts of your myofascia that have been you know, stretched a lot. Other parts have been more strengthened because of the tone that you need to use. And there might be some imbalance, which might play out later as an injury. I'm just, you know, taking an right, example. Right. Yeah. So if you can do, if, I mean, you can do that kind of practice. We all like to do that once in a while. And then you can balance it out by doing a myofascial release technique so that everything is a little more on an even keel for whatever you want to do next, rather than holding the residue of some uneven use of the body that you did for fun. Right. And that applies to things like going bowling or mountain climbing or you know, sitting all day at a conference. I mean, it applies to so many things. Okay, right, yeah. Yeah, very interesting. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the reports you have gotten from your students who, who have uh, practiced this technique with you? Well, um, one of the most frequent things I get is that, that people say things like, oh, I had, you know, I had a <clears throat> herniated disc in my neck and the doctor said I had to go to surgery and I decided to try other things and now my neck is just fine. You know, wow. or wow. 
um, I've had chronic pain in my lower back and now I understand what it comes from. I've been able to change in my lifestyle, make changes in my lifestyle so that I can be more balanced. And if something starts to get uncomfortable, I know what to do to, to, to halt the process. Wow, that's pretty so, amazing. So things I get, and most of my students are, um, you know, artists, doctors, lawyers, ordinary working people. Right. And then, of course, I have a bunch of yoga teachers that come to me, too, to learn this kind of thing. Right, right, yeah. One of the things with it is that it can be hard to figure out, you know, how to get to certain parts of the body in the right way. Yeah, like the neck and other right. parts. So is that something you will be showing in the course you're teaching? Well, I will to some degree, but that is really best handled one to one, you know, in in the studio. I mean, to right. to somebody remotely, what kind of ball they should use is a little difficult. But what I'm going to do is is show the different types of balls that I use. And I think with all the ball techniques that are out there right now, one difference with my technique is that I do have quite a wide variety of balls. And um, I do that because there's a wide variety of people who come to me. <laughs> some people like strong pressure. Some people like gentle pressure. Some people's necks can handle a large ball, or some people's necks prefer a smaller ball. I have different shapes, you know. Right. So I I can vary the technique according to a person's need, oh, and I think really important. Yeah, yeah, and then finding the subtle ways to work even when the ball is there because there's yes. many different ways you can work with the tension once you have the pressure there. Yes, so the practice sequences that are, go along with the course do some of that description, you know, um, where where I talk about how to actually find the tight places and, and work with them. Yeah, yeah. Sounds like an awesome course, Ellen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And any other things uh, people should be aware of in terms of what the benefits they will gain from, from the course and, and the takeaway? Well, two things that, that I want to include that we haven't touched on are the, the lineage of this practice. Because many people think, oh, ball works just come, up, come about in the last 10 years or something. But no, um, the, the antecedents to this method go back almost 100 years. And so I'm happy to be able to describe some of that. And, you know, tell people about the, the, the forerunners of this method. Interesting. And the other thing is that um, it, it, you asked me about those different types of balls. The sizes of the ball and the texture of the ball can make it easier to get into the difficult areas. You know, little teeny area be beside your shoulder blade right. or area in the side of your neck, you know. So right. if you only had one type of ball, you could do a lot, but you... But the variety of body shapes and, and body areas requires a variety of balls. So. Yeah, yeah. There's certain parts of the body, like the terecolumbar fascia, where there's just like a really thick sheet of fascia that can get be really hard to get to. Right. And so there, I presume there's special techniques for that. Yeah. So this is a description that hopefully allows people to be interested to learn more. And I do have trainings that I do both in New York and other places. And I am, I'm going to be publishing a book. So there will be resources for people who want to practice uh, and want more detailed instruction for the actual how-to. Yeah, yeah. That's so cool. And also, um, we were talking about earlier on the fascia web, and I got to thinking about Tom Myers' model of the anatomy trains mm -hmm. uh, and how you know, structures far away and the body are really connected to the yes. you know, parts of the uh, feet that are connected to what's going on in your shoulder. Right. And it sort of relates to what you were saying earlier on with people, you know, coming in and having had a certain issue and it's completely gone, not necessarily because they were working directly on the issue, but yes. some tension was released in another part of the body. Yes, and also sometimes people's problem in a certain part of the body is too sensitive to, to withstand the pressure of a ball. They don't want to do that, but then they can work on some other area. And this happens a lot with the spine. You can work, you know, nearby the tight area and get relief. You can certainly work on on um, parts of your legs and get, re get relief in other parts. And there, there are those connections which are reflecting the fascial web for sure. 
So, you know, have, as I said, having experienced that as a dancer, I was ecstatic when I realized that people were studying it and mapping it out and I could really say, yes, I know what this is. <laughs> <laughs> That's so great. That's, yeah. So are you uh, in the, in the course, are you also going to show how it relates to the anatomy trains and the myofascial meridians? To some degree, yes. Yeah. I don't uh, step on uh, Tom Meyer's toes at all, but I will definitely do <laughs> that, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, Ellen, thank you so much. It sounds like a really exciting and very timely course because, of course, we have the epidemic of chronic pain. So many people are dealing with pain and very few tools to work with pain other than surgery and opioid pain, opioid pain killers, which we all yes. know is uh, not the way you want to go. Yes. So we're very much looking forward to the course. Great. Well, thank you so much for, for talking to me. Yeah, and thanks so much for joining us today. Okay. All right. Take care. Bye for now. Bye-bye.